So this is this is a uh, a paper that um, that I was working on with uh, Caitlin Malazzo in uh, the University of uh, Nottingham, and um, and basically uh, you can see there's a lot of similarities with a lot of people's work, and, and I deliberately deliberately did this so um, we could chat we could chat about this, um, but um, it focuses on. Um, on uh, basically uh, political uh, participation, specifically the question about uh, uh, voter turnout in post-communist uh, systems. And um, as you know, um, uh, you know, it's been remarkable the last 20 years, uh, spread of democracy. Uh, and uh, it appears to be, uh, suggests at least, that there's a strong commitment to uh, democratic values, at least uh, in the ideal. Uh, however, this comes at the same time as uh, uh, sort of well-documented trends uh, that suggest that people <coughs> are quite cynical about uh, the democratic process. Uh, a lot of the evidence comes from established democracies and uh, has been well-documented by uh, Pippa and uh, Restall and others, um, that suggests that uh, many citizens remain quite dissatisfied uh, with the way democracy works in practice. So what's interesting is you have this sort of commitment to uh, democratic ideals and the suggestion that you know, more and more democracies um, are emerging, and yet at the same time, uh, people, uh, at least in, in these long established democracies, remain quite cynical about the political process. Uh, there's been a lot of attention on uh, declining turnout uh, that has been observed in a number of countries. Marty Wattenberg sort of, you know, he's been making his arguments in the 80s <laughs> that uh, parties, uh, that, that the voters are in decline and everything's in decline. It's not necessarily the case. Uh, uh, in the United States, uh, for example, uh, turnout is actually on the rise in the last decade or so. Uh, but for the most part, you've got this sort of trend, uh, this observed trend of, of declining uh, participation. But there is, there is a, a debate about this and the consequences of this. Um, what, uh, what's interesting, if you look at the post-communist uh, countries in, uh, in Eastern Europe, is that uh, when they had their initial elections, uh, when they uh, transitioned into uh, democracies, the first elections actually had uh, very high levels of turnout. And uh, then since then, uh, turnout's declined quite rapidly. And so um, uh, there's been a lot of sort of focus on, uh, on the decline, whether it's sort of just a regression to the mean or what, what's going on, uh, specifically with respect to these new uh, European democracies in, in, in the East. Uh, and it's declined to the point that there is now a difference uh, between uh, East, East and West. And so uh, at the risk, I'm trying to squeeze all this stuff on here. Um, uh, so you probably see it's a nice, nice small room. Um, but um, this is basically just uh, sort of uh, average levels of turnout uh, in European national elections. So we're not talking about European elections. We're talking about national elections. Uh, and I've sort of divided this in terms of uh, the West versus the East. And um, you know, overall, uh, Belgium. Belgium has very high levels of turnout. Uh, the thing is, I mean, they always attribute this. They say, "Oh, yeah, well, Belgium and Australia have high levels of turnout because of compulsory voting, and you know, and uh, it's because of compulsory voting." But compulsory voting, uh, you always also have compulsory voting in other countries where you don't have such high turnout. But, so anyway, um, you've got sort of higher levels of turnout uh, on the, on average in in the West, and so on on average. Uh, uh, you know, across the board in Europe, uh, you know, about over 60% tend to, tend to vote. And you can see that the West average is much higher than the East. So, so the puzzle, so this is what I sort of want to focus on, is why do you have this gap? Uh, why are levels of participation uh, comparatively, relatively different uh, and, 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 and somewhat lower um, in, in the East than, than, than the West? And so that's the sort of puzzle, basically. Um, and as, as, as sort of all sort of great puzzles or great questions, you've got a number of different uh, explanations um, for, um, for the, the <coughs> differential rates in, in, in voter turnout. And, um, and so I've sort of grouped these into uh, sort of various categories. And see the electoral integrity, that's why I, you know, I thought this would be kind of appropriate because of um, uh, corruption. So one, one of the sort of arguments is that you have um, uh, basically growing cynicism about the vote process. People are disengaged. Uh, they're not voting because uh, they're, they're cynical about politicians and the political process. And, and uh, you know, and Pippa's done some work to sort of challenge that, uh, that, that, that argument. Uh, 
there's a, another argument uh, that basically uh, sort of along the lines of um, these post-communist systems, we know that uh, you know, they're highly corrupt. And you know, just all we have to do is sort of see what, what, what's happening in Ukraine and, and uh, how, how the, uh, the, uh, the elected president, I guess, has been exposed for, for major corruption in Russia and, so, and, and other places. And, and, and so this sort of this, this feeling like that, that the government is corrupt or things are rigged uh, tends to discourage people from participating in the political process. That's the sort of argument. Um, there is a, another argument, uh, may, perhaps related, uh, these, these sort of overlap to, to some extent, um, about uh, the lack of competitive elections. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that you don't have competitive elections, uh, people don't see any sort of choice or any, any reason for participating in the political process. Um, this is a common uh, argument um, uh, in, in advanced democracies as well, and I'm sort of talking a lot to, to Tom Grinnell about this, and, uh, what's surprising is there's actually a lack of empirical evidence for, for, for this. Um, so there's this assumption that competition actually fosters um, uh, uh, engagement and, and turnout, but um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of empirical evidence um, for it, surprisingly enough. Um, uh, although I'll show you some today. <laughs> um, uh, economic hardship, uh, sort of argument goes that uh, uh, you know, people who are worse off financially, uh, you know, they're going to be worse off in, in, in the East. Uh, they're, they're not going to uh, participate. Okay? And then finally, this is the sort of, this, this is the explanation that I want to sort of bring in here. Um, and I think this is what sort of makes this unique. And, and, and like a lot of papers that I've, I've written, <laughs> it's sort of fairly obvious. I mean, it seems obvious to me. I mean, I, it just seems like uh, something that seems like a very sort of obvious explanation. Uh, but it's something that you don't see um, uh, a lot in, in, in these sort of arguments. And it has to do with the sort of notion uh, that, uh, you know, perhaps in these uh, post-communist systems, uh, people just don't like democracy itself. And, and, and so to the extent that they, uh, people have uh, or hold authoritarian values uh, and that, that sort of are uh, in, opposed to the democratic ideal, mm -hmm. uh, they, they just won't participate in the political process. So that, that's the sort of stuff I'm looking at here. Um, and I'll just sort of gloss over this. I, I, I'll gloss over the theory and study the results because I, I always think the results are more interesting than, than the theory. But let me just just, 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 focus just very briefly on this um, uh, idea. There's a huge debate about basically about how people transition into democracies. And um, this is not my sort of area of expertise, but uh, basically um, the uh, uh, the, the argument sort of focuses on uh, political socialization and cultural theories and so forth that emphasize uh, one, one argument is that people sort of acquire values, democratic values, for instance, uh, very early in life, you know, and they're socialized into accepting <coughs> the democratic process and so forth. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you sort of accept that, then you sort of raise questions about why you have to find and, and turn up, but that's another uh, story um, in established democracies. Um, but there's this assumption, basically, that in, the, in these post-communist systems that, uh, that younger uh, citizens um, are, are going to be, you know, if you look at the electorate and you, you, you disaggregate the electorate, it's the young people in these countries who uh, sort of grew up uh, and socialized to accept democratic values who are going to be the most likely to support uh, democracy. And, and the people who are socialized you know, under the Cold War are going to have quite different attitudes. And so you're going to see very big sort of generational differences. And you don't necessarily know whether they're uh, generational differences. There's a debate about whether or not uh, there's life cycle effects and generational differences. But the basic assumption is that these younger people uh, in, in, in these post-communist systems are going to be the most committed to democratic values. Okay? So if you sort of extend this argument that they're also going to be um, most more, more likely to sort of participate in the political process um, because they are sort of more likely to embrace it. Okay, so uh, okay, so the way that we um, we approach this question is um, uh, to use um, individual level data, survey data uh, uh, from the uh, comparative study of, uh, of electoral systems. Um, it's widely used. I think if you go to the the website, there's something like a thousand papers have been written with this, which is actually quite amazing when you think that there's not a lot of dependent variables. So voter turnout is one. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, it's a small module of questions, but it, it's an interesting data set. I think it has a lot of 
uh, there's a lot of opportunity to exploit uh, the cross-national uh, features of, 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 of the data. Uh, they're basically national election studies. Um, uh, they're all post-election uh, studies uh, that have um, uh, administered a common module of questions. And so you have the timing, it's very unique, because you have a timing of a cross-national data set uh, in conjunction with the national election. So you can ask questions about whether or not people participated in the election. Now, of course, there are problems, and I mean, we can save that for, 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 for the question in the Q&A, but uh, about a measuring turnout. Um, and uh, I'm not going to show you, actually, um, I showed you before the aggregate turnout. I'm not going to show you the reported turnout. It's highly inflated. There's problems uh, with this, and we can, we can discuss it. Um, but, um, but the specific question, one of the questions that we're most interested in is this question about trying to sort of measure attitudes about democracy itself. And, and I'm sort of limited by what is available. Uh, very, very, very limited. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm not Pip. I can't, I can't get these questions asked in, in a, you know, a lot of places. But, uh, um, uh, but this is, a, you know, authoritarian values. I mean, Rogana Englehart, and, you know, this is asked in a lot of places. So you might ask, you know, why aren't you looking at this in other places? And the answer is that if I'm interested, I'm interested in this sort of post communist stuff. Uh, not because I specialize in it, but you know, because of this specific question. Um, but also this idea of voter turnout, and it's, it's more easily measured in the context of a national election. So I'm limited to this module two, uh, from 2001 to 2006. So this is really dated stuff, okay? And you sort of ask yourself, well, why hasn't anyone, maybe, I mean, why hasn't anyone done this before? I don't, I don't know if they have. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it, but uh, so we got, so basically what I did was I took, we took, just the sample uh, from the CSES, uh, from Module 2, uh, 22 countries in West and Eastern Europe. So it's a subsample. It, we're not exploiting the entire sample because what we're interested in is this question of post-communist <coughs> systems, which, which is quite different than other new democracies in the rest of the world. And what we, we want to do is compare it uh, to, to Western Europe. So if you sort of just accept that approach <laughs> for now. Uh, so this is the distribution on responses to that one, that item that's unique in the mo in module two that asks, uh, uh, how is it phrased again? Uh, democracy may have problems, but it's better than any other form of government. Okay. So these are the percent who disagree with that statement. Okay. So most people tend to sort of agree with statements, and so these are the, uh, this is a, a bit of a conservative estimate about uh, the, about skepticism uh, about democracy. Well, it's a disagreeing rather than agreeing. So I'm, I'm sort of saying here that this, this, this one item sort of taps authoritarian values. And maybe it's not so much of a surprise, but what you see in, is that uh, you know, in these post-communist systems, by and large, um, you know, people are more skeptical about democracy itself. It's, it's not rocket science. <laughs> you know, it's not anything earth shattering. Um, but what, what's interesting, you've got a few outliers here. Albania's very low, Italy's high, and so forth. But you have this sort of difference. And so what I'm suggesting here is that maybe this has something to do with uh, political attitudes and behavior. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you another, uh, another scatter plot here that shows the relationship between this question, authoritarian values, and dissatisfaction with democracy. This is a very common question that's, uh, that's one of the dependent variables that people use from the CSES, but it's also asked in a number of countries. Um, and it's, there's a debate about what it, exactly it's measuring, um, but um, uh, we can sort of assume that it measures some aspect about the democratic process. And uh, so what I have here is the people percent who's dissatisfied with democracy, okay? And so what, 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 what I hope this demonstrates, and what I think it suggests, is that there's a relationship here between what people think about democracy itself and what people think about the functioning of democracy. So these attitudes then affect um, attitudes about the democratic process. And, um, um, and, and, and you know, people should be saying, well, hang on, wait, this is not right, because you know, people can be, um, anyway, well, we'll, we'll yeah. think of that. Um, OK, so <laughs> she's just waiting for her for me. Uh, OK, so, um, so, so the question is, OK, well, who holds these authoritarian values? You know, if we disaggregate this and, and look at this, uh, is it true that we see uh, generational differences uh, between uh, young and, and older people? 
uh, and in, in, in the East and the West, uh, economic circumstances. And then I have here the electoral context. This is where competition comes in. Okay, so I have so contextual variables that um, I can take advantage of because I have a cross-national data set. And, um, and uh, the, unfortunately, um, there, there, are very, there are huge limitations of the data, right? So I don't, I don't even have individual, individual level measures specifically about economic perceptions, as, as, as surprisingly as it might be. Um, <laughs> what I'm using for economic circumstances is basically income, you know, people, uh, people's uh, socioeconomic. So uh, let me show you some results. And I just did something that, that Arthur said he hates. <laughs> I mean, this is the, not, not the way to do this. And I sort of agree with him. I'm, it's laziness in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, this is your sort of typical model. And so what we did was, um, uh, uh, without going into a lot of detail here, so we've got two dependent variables. Um, one is this sort of notion of, um, of, of these, these, these authoritarian values, do you, do you disagree with democracy itself? Do you think it's bad? You know, it, it, there are better forms of government. So we, we have a dichotomous measure. We just simplified it and uh, to the proportion of people who disagree with that statement. Um, and so we have, uh, we have a, we, we use logit basically because we've got a dependent variable that's economist. And, and I've not done it in the most efficient way. I've done it actually in a very inefficient way because what it, done just to illustrate the differences is to stratify it by these countries that are in the East and the West. And it's, it, it, you know, it, it reduces the sample such that we only have eight countries, you know, in the East and 14 um, in the West. Um, in any event, just sort of going through this, um, what, what, what's really interesting, I thought this was quite interesting, is that you don't see any generational differences um, in these questions, which is not only interesting, but it's kind of disturbing in a way because there's all these sort of arguments about political socialization, and you know the younger people, uh, younger generations, and specifically this post-Cold War generation. The reference category is the Cold War generation. You know you should see positive. Um, uh, you know they they they, they should be um, actually negative. It's negative, but it's not significant. So they, they should have more democratic values, and they don't. Uh, at least not statistically significant. Um, Okay, uh, however, in the West, um, the youngest generation um, is uh, actually positive. Right? So, so these people in, in, in Western Europe, uh, yet the youngest generation are more like I hold uh, authoritarian uh, values, um, which is also sort of cause for concern. So, so, so the, 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 the effects aren't going the right way. Uh, I almost got sort of dummy barrels for East and West and, and trying to get a sense of, you know, whether there are ideological differences, education works the way it should in both in both the East and the West, um, and um, and people with low incomes are more authoritarian uh, in both the East and West, and so forth. So um, this is a sort of measure of the, of the context, the margin of victory, just a, a very sort of crude way of measuring electoral competition. And uh, like other studies, there's not a lot of empirical evidence except uh, for uh, dissatisfaction with democracy in the West, where. Uh, basically, uh, where you have a lack of competition, so the, the wider the margin of victory, uh, the more likely people are to be dissatisfied with the political process. So it, it seems to suggest that at least there's a relationship between uh, electoral outcomes and, um, and dissatisfaction. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll sort of gloss over this. this it's a, it's a multi-level model and, and uh, uh, so um, now just to sort of try to make this even more persuasive than than it already is. <laughs> uh, what we've done is we've just taken Germany and we're comparing East and West Germany uh, just, just to sort of see whether or not we see the same differences within, within one country, right? Uh, which was previously divided. And, uh, and I think you see sort of similar results um, uh, uh, specifically with the, 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 that we don't find any significant differences uh, on the generation uh, there. Uh, either in the East or the West, which is again sort of, sort of interesting in a way. I mean, I guess one way you could interpret this is that everyone uh, is either has these democratic values, so it's not just limited uh, to the youngest people in the electorate, or they're all cynical. Uh, one, 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 one other way of interpreting this. Um, and here, what we've done is um, 
We estimate another model here where uh, what we do is we use those two variables that we used um, as dependent variables and we put them in a model predicting uh, turnout, okay? Along with these other sort of uh, questions, questions about perceptions of corruption, uh, co uh, performance. We have a party mobilization thing to sort of tap into this idea of competitiveness. Uh, we have sort of polarization. We're looking at party polarization. I can talk more about that later. Um, but um, uh, what you find, and I think what, what you should sort of take away from this, um, this is the general argument, is that um, it's basically what's happening here is the authoritarian attitudes or values or whatever you want to call them um, basically depresses turnout, okay? And it, it depresses turnout more so, actually the effects are greater in the West than the East. Uh, so people who hold these attitudes are just not participating, okay? Um, and people who are dissatisfied with democracy um, are, are less likely to actually vote, holding con you know, all these other things uh, in the West, right, but not the East, which is another sort of challenge, this is an, uh, a notion which I'll introduce in, in a moment. Um, so uh, party, party mobilization works the way it's expected. This is a very consistent empirical finding. Uh, you know, when people are contacted by political parties, they're more likely to vote. And, uh, uh, and uh, people who have polarized preferences, very strong preferences, uh, they tend to participate. Uh, educated people do as well. So it, it's all sort of fairly consistent with what we've seen before. But the, the sort of general argument that we're making is that um, people uh, with, with sort of these, these, these attitudes about democracy itself it has an influence. OK, so um, just to summarize this, I've got two more slides. Um, the youngest generation does not appear to have acquired uh, more positive attitudes than, than other generations, okay? Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, economic considerations with respect to like income seems, seems to play a role. Uh, but we don't find much evidence uh, that discontent with government and perceptions of governments are related uh, to this. Uh, it does, corruption does appear to depress turnout um, in, in the West. Um, so if you sort of go back to that corruption, uh, the estimate, it's only uh, negative in the West. It's not negative in the East. And this is one of the main explanations for why turnout is low in the East, is this people who you know, think that the system is corrupt. So there's no differences. Maybe everyone thinks it's corrupt. Everyone knows it's corrupt, so they don't participate. Uh, but, but it does have a, 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 a depressing effect in, in the West. Okay? So, um, so what we sort of argue, our argument, <coughs> is that this lack of participation is closely related to orientations to democracy. And, uh, finally, I just want to focus on, on, on this idea of, um, and I did this deliberately for, for Pippa's benefit, of this democratic deficit. So, so I, I just, I love, there's two books now on this, this idea of critical citizens, which I, re I, really, I really like the argument. Um, and uh, basically, the, the, the sort of, the, the issue of the puzzle is that in a lot of these established democracies, People are dissatisfied with the democratic process, right? They're cynical about the process, but they're, they're engaged, okay? So the, 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 the people that are cynical but engaged are what um, Pippo refers to as these sort of critical uh, citizens, and they're a positive force in democracy. Um, and, and they tend to participate, I think, to be fair, in, in unconventional ways. So they're more likely to protest and demonstrate and so forth. So these are educated people who are cynical about the political process, who are not just withdrawing from it, but they're engaged in the process. Um, what, uh, so we're not looking at, at, at protests or demonstrations. We're just looking at conventional forms of political participation, voting the most common form of participation. And, and in this sense, uh, I think what the evidence suggests here is that when people are cynical about the political process or somewhat skeptical and controlling for sort of other factors, they're, they're more likely to sort of withdraw from the political process. Um, and, um, and, and, and I, I also want to emphasize this part, that, um, that there doesn't appear to be this gap, this democratic deficit in, in these post-communist systems where you have high cynicism um, but, but still supportive of democratic values. So there's, there's a relationship between democratic values and, uh, and dissatisfaction. Um, and, and finally, um, uh, I think you know, the, the, the concern here is that these youngest group of, of, of people uh, tend not to appear to be more supportive of democratic values. So that's, that's the argument. Thanks. Okay.
Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Arthur, you call on those others. Yes. Yes. Um, sorry. Yes. Oh, no worries. Thanks. 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 Yeah, I was delighted to uh, be asked to discuss uh, this paper by Jeff. Well, this is great to be here, and I'm, uh, thank you particularly for people for inviting me. So, this is an uh, interesting paper, and I very much enjoyed uh, reading it. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the overview of the paper, and I'll talk about uh, specific contributions, which I think one should take away from it um, in general in, in one's own work. You know, what, what, what could you uh, build on here? And then I'll have some uh, more. Um, I don't know, critically encouraging comments. Okay. All right. So this yeah, is uh, uh, with um, sort of backsliding of democracy in Eastern Europe. That's not a term I think that Jeff uses, but yeah, we see it sometimes in, in literature. And in Jeff's case, he's interested in this backsliding relative to Western Europe. So maybe we're all backsliding, but um, Eastern Europe is backsliding faster. So uh, we see this in uh, recent times. It's not hard to find um, evidence of this. This is um, Bulgaria's corruption scandal. You know, ministers get arrested for uh, these very bad <coughs> outcomes. And of course, um, even more recently, in the last few weeks, we've seen uh, discussion of uh, um, bad elections or, or governments not listening to the people in Ukraine, um, you know, and then Russia um, annexing places. So two components to uh, this backsliding, and Jeff picks up on both of these. So there's some notion of a decreased faith um, in democratic outcomes. So here we mean um, sort of a notion of um, what, what does this thing that we call democracy uh, give us, right? And so um, this might be I don't know, the, the particular people who get elected, um, how co corrupt the system is, um, who gets represented properly, you know, are business interests represented or overrepresented or something like this. And the second component is a notion of faith in democratic procedures. And procedures here, specifically in Jeff's case, he's interested in um, elections, but I guess in fact um, there is some broader notion. So it could be things like, you know, d does the justice system work properly or something like this. So what is Jeff doing? Well, he's going to try and look at uh, this process um, here. So uh, we typically think there might be a very interesting, perhaps subtle causal relationship. But we want to know how this decreased faith in democratic outcomes, um, so our perception of how good or bad our democracy is, affects, and this is going to be Jeff's sort of current <coughs> attitudes, um, affect democratic procedures. And here, um, one democratic procedure that most citizens in principle can involve themselves in is voting. And so that's going to be uh, the specific case of the procedure that uh, Jeff is, is, finds compelling. And uh, he, he introduces some new data, or uses some data in a new way, um, and some new methods uh, to get at that uh, question. So it's stated in a very broad way there, but Jeff's very specific, and we'll, we'll get into that. All right. So. So what's the contribution? Um, so uh, first things first, um, I'm, a, um, I'm not, I do some comparative work, but I, w I was not aware of this, um, this declining relative turnout. I thought that was really nicely documented. Sets up the puzzle very nicely, just as a stylistic point. Um, and it really gets into sort of authoritarian attitudes. And it says, you know, the paper says, well, we should really think hard about the attitudes people might have uh, to um, you know, less democratic systems. And then Jeff says, well, that's not enough. So it's one thing to just stick that in a regression, I guess. But then uh, he also gets into, what is the causal process by which we might have these authoritarian attitudes? And he talks about things like socialization, uh, which is to do with, a, in this case, the socialization era, so socialization period of life, um, whether you have economic disillusionment, so maybe you're not very happy with how privatization of national industry worked out, or something like that. Um, uh, and then also the political context, which actually is very specific in this case and means basically how, how competitive is the system. All right? So less about things like representation and more about things that we can you know, measure uh, relatively easily. So what's uh, important and new is that we are now on the individual level with this uh, survey data. And Jeff gave some uh, discussions, very candid discussions uh, there, and I think also in the paper about um, it's a little bit restrictive in terms of what you can do, but this is something that we can really get into, this notion of micro decision making over whether you should turn out or not. Some hierarchical models, and um, the paper moves in phases. It's very clean as it moves between them. It says that, well, I think that he thinks that 
authoritarian attitudes seem to be mostly the product of education and income, um, uh, although actually that's not really the punchline of the paper. Um, there's some discussion of socialization, which I'll get into in a minute, and um, that doesn't seem to be especially important for developing authoritarian attitudes. Um, there's a nice little case study of Germany. I have more to say about that in a second. And then um, this is the real kind of punchline that once we control for the usual suspects, which here are things which other scholars think might be important, um, if you have an authoritarian attitude, this does depress turnout. Um, and uh, that's sort of the, the core finding, at least for me, from the paper. And I think that's a, an important one. Uh, and it gives us some sense of uh, you know, civic responsibility and what causes problems. So um, let me sort of critique. I want to sort of critique the theory part first. And I, I sort of come uh, from outside the literature. So if, if these comments seem uh, ignorant, you can either assume that uh, I don't know what I'm talking about or this 30 years of literature is wrong, one of the two. <laughs> right, so, um, so for me, Jeff spends some time, actually, and I think it's because the theory is well established, I think, um, talking about socialization period. Um, he says, well, you know, we want to try and rule out or ruling, um, does it matter when you came of age, right, in terms of what your, your attitudes towards these new democracies are? So the problem for me, and it may even be stylistic, is the paper starts out by saying that what motivates writing the paper is the fact that turnout is declining. So this doesn't quite fit, um, this doesn't, I don't quite understand this in the sense that presumably your socialization period is fixed for the individual. If you, you know, if we care about individual, what is affecting individual behavior, um, it should be the some notion of that we used to turn out and then we stopped turning out. You don't have panel data, that's okay. Um, but then I couldn't understand socialization period for a given individual is fixed. And so at a micro level, there's a bit of a disconnect there between having something which is a fixed effect for you and then saying that should affect whether or not you choose to turn out in the future. Now, I think what uh, Jeff's tapping into instead is some notion of some relative share of the cohort. So there's some notion that if I had panel data, if I had waves and waves of individuals, I could observe the fact that as people um, who this pre-Cold War generation die off, then we should expect to see an increase in turnout. And then the puzzle is, why are we not seeing it? Uh, so I thought that was a, an interesting um, idea, but I couldn't quite, these things didn't quite connect for me in the paper. Okay. So Jeff's quite candid about um, problems with these surveys and survey instruments. And what it, um, as he said in his presentation, what a lot of it comes down to at the, at the core of it is asking people, what do you think of, you know, what do you think of, uh, what is your satisfaction with democratic outcomes? How satisfied are you with democracy? Or just, democracy gives you the best, generally gives the best um, world. Is, is that correct? Something, something like that. How much do you agree or disagree with that? So, in passing, you sort of allude to the fact that the, this this type of question has validity problems, but it's worth think, sort of going into detail about what they they might be. So when you ask, you know, somebody who's living in the Ukraine or uh, Bulgaria, what do you think of democracy? It's unclear to me what exactly whom they're asking answering for. So they may be asking answering for themselves, um, in which case they may not really be talking about democracy in the sense that they're not talking about it as some abstract concept. They're talking about it as a term that's applied to outcomes they observe in Bulgaria. But we would think that those outcomes in Western Europe, we would think that those outcomes are not really democratic. And so democracy becomes this, yeah. this misnomer for them. So that um, concerns me, uh, and I didn't really know who they're answering for. Um, similarly, if we ask some Danes, what do you think of democracy? And they're thinking about maybe the Danish welfare state, and they're thinking about, you know, that Denmark is a very, very nice place to live in. They're not thinking about democracy broadly defined. They're not thinking about Fenian democracy, where only um, men can vote or something. So that was something I was a bit um, puzzled by. So what? Um, the paper ends up concluding, Jeff talked about a second ago, is this notion that um, you, are, you have these authoritarian values and say, I'm, I'm just not going to vote. That, that kind of somehow uh, makes me feel alienated and I don't really like democracy. Um, but we, we know that there are countries um, in which, well, it's compulsory voting, I suppose, but there's many other countries too, um, in which um, authoritarian voters do certainly go out to the polls and they vote for authoritarian parties. So, for example, in Britain, up until very recently, uh, the, the British National Party, uh, sort of this relatively small uh, right-wing uh, party, uh, anti-immigrant party, 
used this to its advantage, and it tried to drive people to the polls to vote for them, right? And they're a relatively authoritarian party. And so I just, I just wondered, what is the mechanism here? Why is it that these uh, folks are kind of opting out? What it seems to me is that they're somewhat maybe indifferent between the options they're being offered. I don't know. And that doesn't really, that doesn't really uh, there's not much uh, discussion of that in the paper. And I was curious as to whether they're behaving rationally, right? So if I was actually had this real authoritarian streak, maybe I'd turn out and vote for uh, parties that were going to get rid of democracy, right? And that's a problem that we see in um, transitional places like Egypt. Let's have an election, and you know, party wins and says, all right, first rule, no more elections. Okay. So the second thing was causal direction. So here, there's this attitude that there's this notion that your attitudes will lead you to turn out or not. Okay. Now there is. Um, <laughs> a literature in sort of the US civics education uh, tradition that says that actually it's this kind of simultaneous thing or it's actually a very tight feedback loop. So you, uh, you turn out and that makes you a better citizen. So that makes you this political animal and that changes your attitudes. Doesn't matter if you lose, it's kind of you played the game and that somehow improves your sort of sense of self. So you write that as a congressman, they're completely ineffective, but somehow it makes you sort of buy into the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the process. Um, and I, I just would, would have liked in the paper to see more discussion of why we think it goes one way. Why doesn't turning out to vote or, you know, affect your attitudes? Or maybe it does, in which case that's probably something that's going to make a model a bit more complicated. All right, so on the empirical side, um, some sort of a little bit more technical comments. So um, a lot of these variables look post-treatment to me, So, which is to say that you know, what, we, what we're trying to, if we were doing an experiment, what we'd like to do is say, let's give everyone some amount of authoritarian attitudes and see whether or not it affects their turnout. The problem is, there's a lot of stuff in there which um, occurs almost certainly because you have authoritarian attitudes. So your decision of whether you go to university or not is probably highly influenced, I suspect, I don't know, but is probably influenced by what your whether you have authoritarian attitudes or not. Um, I suspect that it might even affect your income. Um, you know, you hang around with different types of people, you might do different types of jobs because you have these attitudes. It might affect your perceptions of what is corruption, um, and therefore it might it may also affect dissatisfaction with democracy. Now, the issue is, from a econometric perspective, that these are all in the equation. So these are all coming after the treatment variable, which is authoritarian attitudes. So why does that matter? You're going to get some bias coefficients. Um, you know, reviewers get upset about these things. Uh, that makes authors upset, but I don't know if authors get directly upset. Okay. Um, for me, just as a re reader, I wanted to see more discussion of the coefficients. So these are logit equations, and we're saying, well, authoritarian attitudes have a negative effect on whether you turn out or not. But you know, typically, we would say something a bit more than that, like, well, if you move from this box of authoritarian attitudes to this other box, this is how your probability of turning out is affected. And why would you do that? Well, because we want to, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, um, statistical significance is interesting, but we want to know sort of this is whether these effects are substantively large. And if they are substantively large, I think that's a real uh, selling point of the paper. It's difficult in Jeff's case because he's coarsening the variables with some other standardization uh, going on. So authoritarian attitudes is a coarsened variable. And what happens is you say, well, we've got agree and strongly agree. That becomes a zero, I think. And then disagree and strongly disagree, and that becomes a one. That's OK. I mean, it's standard practice. Um, but I didn't understand why you wanted to do that. So you seem to have a lot of data. Maybe I'm misunderstanding exactly how much data you have. I think there are thousands and thousands of responses. So it seems to me, at least, to just disaggregate that. We tend to see coarsening when it's very obvious that this thing is just 0 or 1. Um, but for some reason, the underlying data instrument uh, is, uh, was, was more, um, had more uh, gradation than we needed. Um, but this seems sort of arbitrarily coarsened, and so you may as well just stick in um, what their actual view was. Um, it's harder to interpret, maybe, but still might be, um, uh, it might be more helpful once you've done the interpretation. Um, uh, final couple of, of comments. So, so in the paper, East and West have considered these completely sort of exogenous categories, and you know, these are two sets of separate regressions. But that doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, so I read the paper and it says, well, we're going to have this multi-level model. So we're going to have uh, citizens within countries. Presumably, if we had other administrative units, we put them within that. So it struck, strikes me that you should just think of East and West as other hierarchical units. So here's East, and then here's countries within East, and here's citizens within countries. 
And then you could look directly at those coefficients and see if maybe uh, they actually differ across the regions. And then you can, instead of saying, here's the east, here's the west, you can say there is or is not an east-west uh, effect. And you can think of just as a prosaic analogy, you think of it as times in region by altitude, and then looking at the interaction effect. I, I didn't quite follow the, the, the Germany analysis, I must say. Um, so um, I, I understood the, the, what, what it had to say, which was that the attitudes effects that you see hold up in Germany. Um, but I, so basically, I was thinking, you know, so what? Um, of course, I, ex I expect them to in some sense. I mean, you, as I understand what's going on in the multi-level model, you're saying, right, there's a random effect on these countries. And you know, that's a standard hierarchical setup. So you, you already get that in your final regressions. The bit about Germany, that for me anyway, I believe your multi-level regression, so I don't need to see uh, one country. There must be something, I assume there's something else that you mean by this, um, some other philosophical point you're making. Maybe that somehow this, you know, we're really controlling for the fixed effect. Anyway, I didn't quite follow that. So parting thoughts. All right, so uh, the paper is maybe, I don't know, not the most optimistic about what's going to happen. Um, gloomy. So voters don't trust politicians, that's sort of a thing, then they don't vote. Um, where don't trust is this authoritarian bit. Politicians presumably then can be corrupt because it's not very competitive, and then voters don't trust politicians, and on off we go. So that seems quite gloomy. On the other hand, we know that sort of the West has been through these bouts of anti-system feeling. So um, this one, the UK is sort of recovering from one at the moment. Um, there are these MP expenses scandals, and we know that uh, the US had a huge one, obviously, at Watergate. What did it end up doing? It then ended up clearing out Republicans and electing a whole bunch of very young Democrats, and that led to sort of some fundamental changes in house organization there. Um, so the West goes through these things. Um, maybe it's these are bouts, and you're thinking of some systematic effect, uh, and it recovers typically through two related mechanisms. The one is through new politicians, and the other is through new rules. So, you know, would this be possible in Eastern Europe? I just wondered, and that would be a less negative conclusion. On the other hand, um, we know that one thing that's uh, affecting authoritarian attitudes, at least as I read the paper, is sort of economic situation. And if economic growth is generally positive, is it one of these things where we say, oh, okay, we think that over time, you know, this will uh, right itself, um, because these countries will get wealthier, and things will be, will be fine. So we've just got to wait 100 years or something, or 50 years, hopefully, or 10 years or something. Um, I, I like the paper, and um, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a great effort. And, uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.